Hi, my name is Pastor Ronald Kozar, and I'm the senior pastor at Alpha Lions Dead Ministries in Derry, Pennsylvania. I'm just an old football player that has been saved by grace. I played several years with the New England Patriots and with the Detroit Lions. I just want to take this opportunity to welcome you into one of our services. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Exodus. Exodus 23. We've been doing a series on the feast days, and then we just did two or three parts on the feast of trumpets, because we're in the month of Tishri. Now, we're going to share a little bit. We're going to do two or three series just on the Feast of Tabernacles. Because listen, the two most holiest months of the entire year, the one is Abib, which is our April, or otherwise known as Nisan. And the second of the holiest months, I say they're equal in holiness or importance to God, is Tishri. And Tishri is our October. Okay? October is extremely important. And I believe that we have a responsibility to tell as many people as we can why it's as important as it is. So, out of these feasts of the Lord and the holy days, we have three that are extremely important. The one is the Feast of Trumpets, of which we've been speaking of, of, which I believe that when that last trumpet sounds, that's when the Lord will return. I believe that that is a part of the final three feasts of the Lord, that are known as the Fall Feasts. So we have the Feast of Trumpets, that happens first, and before that, the Jews have a tradition of 30 days of prayer and fasting. So they are preparing their self. And then it's known as like the 10 days of awe. You have that period in there from the Feast of Trumpets that take you to Tishri 10, which the 10th of Tishri is the Day of Atonement. And that is just not individual atonement, even though we should always be taking care of ourselves. But that is an atonement for the nations. It's where the, the world itself needs to be preparing itself for the return of the Messiah. And then that takes us to Tishri 15, which is really not even October 15th, because according to God's calendar, you start out each month on the new moon. So it doesn't happen on October 15th every year. As a matter of fact, it doesn't happen on October 15th. But it gives you that window of a seven-day feast, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, what I found in my life to be of such importance in all these things, and to really see the importance of God's holy days, we could actually see the scheme of the devil, where the devil, it says in, in uh, Daniel 7.29, it says that he desires to change times and laws. So we know the spirit of the Antichrist is in the earth today and he's trying to change everything so people are not prepared for the day of the Lord. You know, that, that's all that's left. I mean, what, what gets me is, and, and I say this humbly, as some of the people in the church that have not caught the revelation yet and they go, everything's fulfilled. You ever hear them say that? All prophecies fulfilled, everything's fulfilled been fulfilled. The only thing needs to happen is Jesus needs to return. Well, that's not true. Because we know all three of the feasts need to be fulfilled yet. All three of the, all three of the feasts need to be fulfilled. And, and the church needs to know them according to Acts 3.21 where it says Jesus, he, Jesus is being held in heaven until the restoration of all things. So we have these days that are interwoven, and I'm going to show you tonight, and maybe not all of it tonight. I might get all the scriptures in tonight, but I'm going to show you why this is so important. Because a lot of people think, well, some of these feasts are just written to the Jewish people in their Old Testament, and it doesn't apply to us now. Well, we need to address that. We need to show you how it's all part of the New Testament. It's all part of everything. As a matter of fact, I, I can show you that Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. So I'm going to say this right off the get-go. Jesus' first coming was during the Feast of Tabernacles. And I personally believe Jesus' second coming will be a part of the Feast of Tabernacles. I believe that's how it's going to happen. I believe he came the first time during the Feast of Tabernacles. And I believe he's going to come the second time during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's how important this is. But then, even then, when Jesus comes, is it over? Do we quit honoring these? Do we quit, um, I use the word honor them, because I don't want our Gentile people to go back and want to convert to Judaism. Because that's the problem that the apostolic teachings have, is you've got to be able to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. So as soon as you go back and you want to teach someone something about the Old Testament, then they just want to go back and convert to Judaism. Next thing I know, they'll be building the temple, and then they'll be building the, the tabernacle, and then they'll be, you know, they already have their prayer shawls and all those things, and it's great if you want to do that. I'm all fine for that if you want to pray that way. But, but when Jesus came, the, I, I understand he made the two one, but that's creating a whole new, a new man. So what we need to be able to do is rightly divide the word of truth so we know how these things fit. There are certain laws and rules and regulations that Jesus set us free from. But listen, there are other eternal covenants and things that God said that these are to be proclaimed and taught and teach forever. I mean, we look at these feast days and how God said they're to be holy convocation. They're to be proclaimed. They're to be preached, teached, and you're to instruct people in these things. These have not quit. I mean, the blood moons and the things that God did on the earth through the blood moons, if that did not tell you, if that did not tell mankind that God was still working through these seven feasts, they'll never understand. And just because of people's ignorance, they don't understand it, so they just write it off. They, they throw the baby away with the bathwater. They say, oh, that's just Old Testament, or oh, that's just Jewish stuff. No, this is all real. This is all real for today. That's why the things that are happening, that are happening. Hallelujah. Um, I said uh, Exodus 23. Let's go to um, Leviticus 23. You love how I change my mind like that. Huh? I can do that when I'm up here. I might even change it again. We'll go right here. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The, these are the three times of... of where we are right now, Leviticus 23, 23, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying in the seventh month on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, the memorial blowing of the trumpets. That's the feast of trumpets. Verse 26, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying on the 10th day of the seventh month, this shall be the day of atonement. So this is the day of atonement. Leviticus 23, verse 34 says the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Verse 37, these are the Feast of the Lord which you shall proclaim. That word proclaim means to preach, teach, and instruct. You're to preach, teach, and instruct to be holy convocations. So these are holy dress rehearsals. You're to be telling people when to do and how to do and what to do. Hey, somebody said... Somebody said, well, hey, um, we're just honoring Jesus' birthday. I said, well, first of all, because, see, people speak out of their flesh. And they just go, well, um, okay, I'm just going to honor Jesus' birthday, and we're going to do it in December. Well, first of all, that's not what God told us to do. Why? how are you doing, buddy? The... Um, God told us when to do it. And, and listen, how about if you knew when your birthday was and you're all amped up for your birthday and you want everybody to honor you on your birthday and, and all of a sudden your, your birthday's uh, somewhere during Tishri 15 to 1522, we can at least get it in that window. And you're all ready for people to honor you and people to preach and teach about your first coming to the earth. And, and listen, 
This is for the Son of God. And all of a sudden, they're watching from heaven and they're going, the whole world's going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. The whole world's going to celebrate the coming of the Messiah. And they're all waiting. It's up there and it's, it's, it's our October. And Jesus has redeemed us. And they're watching down from heaven and they're looking and they're looking and they're going. What are they worshiping the devil in October for? Why do, why do they have dead bodies hanging everywhere? Why do they have skeletons everywhere? Why are they celebrating and worshiping witches and warlocks and, and graveyards and tombstones? And I see things like when people buy people's houses. I feel bad for them. Could you imagine what God is thinking? So listen, my friend, it's just not a matter of knowing the feast days. And then it's not just a matter of, of worshiping a false idol, meaning the jolly fat guy in the red suit in Christmas. But it's a matter of when you combine the two together. And, and I said to someone the other day, I go, hey, Merry Christmas using their terminology. They, they look at me and they go, when you mean that, it's not Christmas. I'm like, well, what is it then? Uh, we're celebrating Halloween. Oh, well, where's Jesus' birthday in all this? Well, we celebrate that in December. That's when we do our Merry Christmas thing. I'm like, well, wait, that's not the right time for that. You're so deceived, you don't even know, and I'm saying this humbly, I try to get this across in love, but i got to show you somehow. You don't even know the feast days and what they represent as far as the importance of what God says they are. You, you miss that, and you only just don't miss that. You worship an idol. You worship a foreign god. The same as Passover and Easter and April. And we can go through the same thing. But especially for the birth of Jesus. Could you imagine nobody celebrating your birthday for your entire, listen, for 2,000 years. If they miss your birthday once, you get mad at them. They say, nobody, can, can you believe my husband didn't get me anything? Could you believe my wife? Two big parts of our ministry, first of all, is our truck or his food ministry. And the truck that represents that ministry is on the left. And then on the right, the other big outreach that we have for our ministry is our bus outreach that travels uh, for our services and picks up people that need a ride to church. Right? I mean, come on, let's be honest. I mean, we're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about God saying in his word that these are holy convocations. These, you are to proclaim these, preach, teach, and instruct these forever. They never stop. Just because we're in the New Testament, do you think God is not going to fulfill the final three feasts? Listen, if he don't fulfill them, my friend, you might as well throw the book in the garbage can. God has to fulfill the feasts. He fulfilled the first four, Passover, unleavened bread, feast of first fruits, and the day of Pentecost. He fulfilled them on their exact day. Not randomly any other day, not Easter Sunday, not all these perverted things that we've been taught. God did it exactly when he was supposed to do it, just like we're supposed to do it on the days we're supposed to do it. Hallelujah. Did I say we're in Leviticus? Did I read the three days in Leviticus yet? I did? Did I tell you Leviticus 23, 37? These are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim. You shall preach, teach, and instruct to be holy convocations, holy dress rehearsals. Listen, these are holy to God. And here, this 
this is the month of October that we're in. God's Tishri, God's holiest month of the year. And, and I'm telling you, there's a select few group of people on the earth that even know that it's Jesus' birthday. They're not celebrating his first coming. They're not celebrating his birth at all. As a matter of fact, Bob brought it up to me before the service about what, hey, we could do the birthday party for Jesus now. And we should do it. We should do it now. I'd love to do that now. I'd love to have a big party and put signs out there and just say Merry Christmas. I mean, use their language or put Happy Birthday Jesus out there. I don't even like saying Merry Christmas though. But if you said Merry Christmas, it would get the point across to them that they think we're absolutely nuts. But at least it would give them an opportunity to know what we're celebrating. Because they think we're crazy anyway. But listen, but listen, very narrow is the gate. Straight is the way that leadeth into eternal life, and very few there will be to find it. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth into eternal destruction, and many there are that go there. I really, and this is one thing I've never touched. God has never given me anything on who makes it and who don't. I mean, I know generality on, okay, if we believe in Jesus, we're saved. But I know a lot of people that, that say they believe in Jesus, and I don't know if they're going to make it. I mean, it just breaks my heart. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Now go to Deuteronomy 16. In, in all these verses, I'm showing you all the feasts are in there, but I'm just showing you the, the ones right now. He says, he talks about these three times of the year here, because these are very important, of which he has the feast in, in uh, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. At one, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Passover season. Two, the Feast of Weeks, that is Pentecost. And three, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear empty-handed before the Lord. Every man shall give how as he is able. You're to give as you are able, as God has blessed you, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Now, I wrote down some scriptures because there are so many. Usually I just always re remember these things. But th that is how it starts, Okay. That is how the things start. But now I want you to go. I want you to go to. Um, let's just start out in Joel. Let's go to Joel two. Are you with me? Do you guys know where Joel is? It's in your Bible. The book of Joel. The book of Joel. Joel. Some of these are hard to find. I actually had these marked until my wife took the. Uh, she took my Bible from me. Did you see that, Joel? My wife took my Bible and let the kids read. Joel 2. Okay, now listen to this. Joel 2. Joel 2. Are you with me? Joel 2. Look what it says here. We are going to talk a little bit about the day of the Lord. Okay? Because I'm telling you, the day of the Lord... The day of the Lord has a lot to do with the Feast of Tabernacles and also the Feast of Trumpets and also the Day of Atonement. I, but this is my personal belief, this is what I personally believe. As God roped those first four feasts together and he fulfilled them in a 50-day period, you have the Passover, Unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. God fulfilled all those within a 50 day period. The Messiah was crucified, he was given up, he was placed in the tomb, he rose from the dead, and he also sent the Holy Ghost. He fulfilled all four of them in a 50 day group, period. I personally believe he will do the same as far as the last three feasts go. There are some people that are pre-tribulation people that believe that the rapture has to take place at the beginning of the tribulation. So what, that, what this does for them is it imposes a problem because the, the Feast of Trumpets 
It's definitely, I believe and many believe, that when the Lord is going to come back to the earth. It'll be during the Feast of Trumpets. But now you don't know which of the Feast of Trumpets. You can look for it every year. you just got to be prepared for it. But if they say, what gets me is if the Feast of the Trumpets happens way at the beginning of the Tribulation, then what's the trumpet that's blown at the end of the Tribulation where the dead in Christ will rise and the judgments will take place and it's the seventh trumpet and it's the last trumpet? You cannot have them both happen at two different periods. I, I, just, I just can't see God doing that. There's no way he can do that. It just doesn't make sense that way. It just doesn't fit together that way. But so we're talking about the day of the Lord and we're going to see does this have anything to do with the Feast of Tabernacles. I say it does if it is the second coming of Christ. No, we need to see if what happens on the day of Christ. What happens on the coming of Christ? What does, is it the Feast of uh, Tabernacles? Is it ever mentioned? I mean, does it end? What happens with it? So he says here in Joel 2, at the end of verse 1, it says, Let the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day, look, for the day of the Lord is coming. For it is at hand, a day of darkness, of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. And then it talks about these people who come. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful army. It's just an <laughs> unbelievable army. So then go to verse 12. And this is, what, this is what God says. He says, the day of the Lord is coming, of which I believe that's all going to be kicked off by the Feast of Trumpets. Then all of a sudden, we know there's a day of atonement. There's a time for the nations. There's a time that God warns people, listen, you are to be repenting. You're to be mourning. You're to be examining yourself. You're to be prepared. Well, for preparing for what? It's for preparing for the day of the Lord, because you don't know which one of these tissues he's going to come. So look at this. Look, oh, just because I don't have the time, I could go through this every single, I could go through every single verse here and, and show you this stuff about the day of the Lord and the body's coming and all this. But all of a sudden, I want you to see that, I want you to see the, um, the day of atonement, the repentance part of this. In Joel 2.12, he says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and listen, and not your garments. This is about the inner man. This isn't about the outside of you and what we do. This is about the innermost parts of you. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. He relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent a leave of blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow, look, blow the trumpet in Zion. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Listen, this is all happening. He's saying in Joel chapter 2, we're talking about the day of the Lord. And this is what he's telling you to do going into this day, what you're to be doing. He says you need to be repenting. You need to be preparing yourself. You need to sound the trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets first, the Day of Atonement second. Repent, prepare yourself. And then for the coming of the Lord, there's going to be things that happen right before the coming of the Lord. So he said sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and even the nursing babes. Get them all together. Let the bridegroom go out for his chamber. And for the bride from her dressing room. Did, did we just not, did I just not tell you about the, about the bride and about the bridegroom? And about the Feast of Trumpets and how they, how they prepared themselves and how they separated themselves from one another? And how the bridegroom went out and prepared the house and he was separate from the wife? You need, you need, you need to go to YouTube and listen to last week's sermon. Listen to the sermon from Wednesday. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. This is just wonderful stuff. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Now listen to this. He says, 
But I will remove you, I will remove far from you the northern army, and I will drive him away into a very desolate land. Now, let's get down to this former latter rain in verse 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice with the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. Has, has not God been faithful? Yes, he has. And he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and also the latter rain. Okay? Now listen. There's only so, so many ways that you get the former and latter rain. And you've got to know what he's talking about when he speaks about the former and latter rain. Because I'm telling you something. I'm going to show you something later in Zechariah where God says that he will not he will not let rain come down on the nations who do not honor him through the Feast of Tabernacles. This is another aspect of our outreach. We have the Dairy Junior High School that our ministry purchased. And what we did is we put apartments, we refurbished apartments across the top of this building that we rent out to families. So this is another very large part of our ministry. In addition to that, as you will see over here to the right hand side of the building that we also have a daycare that operates out of this building. And that's after the day of the Lord. That is when God comes back, when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom on this earth and he rules and reigns for a thousand years, which is a millennium. And he says, during that period, he said, these nations that will not honor the Feast of Tabernacles, I am going to cut rain off from those nations. They will not be blessed at all. So look what he's saying there. He says, for he's given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and also the latter rain in the first month. That, that's pretty interesting because we know the, this, this first month, is the other holiest month of the year of which the Passover takes place. And the other holy month that God says that we're to proclaim and teach is Tishri, and that's the month where the Feast of Tabernacles take place. So you have the beginning of the three most holiest days, which would be Passover in the first month, and then you have the Feast of Tabernacles, which would be in the seventh month. Now, now look, look at this. Do you know how many people have said, that's prophesied and said, God says he'll restore to you the years that the squirming locusts have eaten and the crawling locusts, look, and the consuming locust and the chewing locust, and he goes through all these different locusts and all these animals and this, all this destruction that this army has, has created. And then look whose army it is. You're rebuking the devil. You're fighting the devil. You think it's the devil. And it's not the devil. I've been hearing that for years. People saying about the destruction and prophesying over people and speaking over people and saying that God's saying that he'll restore the years the locusts have eaten and the canker worms destroyed and all this bad stuff that the devil's done in your life and God's going to do it. Well, listen, God's, God's not giving the devil credit for doing anything. Nothing. Because nothing happens without God's approval anyway. But right here, speaking of this army, according to the word of God, it says, this is my great army, which I sent among you. We have a hard time dealing with that. That there are sometimes things happen, and it's for the greatest, greater purpose of God. This is all about dying to yourself. Now, I know sometimes you're under an onslaught from the devil, but there's usually a reason for that, too. But specifically about this verse here, I hear so many people take that out of context all the time. He said, this is my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Verse 28, and it shall come afterward. Listen, this is exactly what it says in, in uh, Acts 2, I think verse 20. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You guys know this. People quote these verses all the time. We're talking about the day of the Lord. That's this time frame of when this is going to happen. That I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And listen, even on my men servants. 
And on my maidservants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. And I'll show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Now look at this, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Now listen, we've been seeing a lot of this stuff lately, but then he says this, the sun shall be turned into darkness. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon shall be turned into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now we're speaking about the day of the Lord. And I'm telling you, this day of the Lord is wrapped in right with the Feast of Tabernacles. But this day of the Lord, now listen, for those of you who haven't studied the blood moons and that, you need to go in and actually really see what's happened during the blood moons and what God has accomplished through all this. Be because what I'm trying to preach, teach, and show you is God had to get all these things going. God had to get all these things fulfilled in order to set the stage for the coming of the Messiah. After Israel was destroyed and after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and the Jews were dispersed all over the world, Jesus could not come back to Jerusalem then because there was no Jerusalem. So we know in order for God to fulfill this scripture in, in Joel 3, 7, where he had to come back to his land, that he would stand on the Mount of Olives, that he would come back to Jerusalem, which is his own land, Israel would have had to become a nation again. For 2,000 years, all the doubters and all the unbelievers, they, what could they say? Because listen, the first time in the history of the world that a people were absolutely slaughtered and dispersed all over the world, there wasn't one stone left upon another. I mean, the Romans just, they ground that land up, they overturned every single building, burnt everything, took each brick and busted them apart and scattered them all over the place, sent the Jews out of there, dispersed them all over the world. And ever since then, everybody's been trying to kill the Jews even when they weren't in their own land. So what I'm trying to show you is, is I'm painting a picture of things that God had to pour or God had to restore back into the church to prepare the world, to prepare the church for the coming of the Lord. Because listen, if we wouldn't know the feast days, we would never know when Jesus is coming. If you talk to most of just people in your average day churches, they, they have no idea because they preach and teach. No man knows that they're the hour. And I'll guarantee you they're celebrating the, ho the holidays and not the holy days. And if you're doing that, you're off. That's just that's as simple as, as you can make it, but it's true. So he says this, behold in those days, in Joel 3, 1, Behold, in those days, and at that time, this is another one of those Mohadims. They are divinely appointed times by God. I was telling you about the blood moons. I'll never forget, I was out in the parking lot, and somebody asked me, they said, well, Pastor Ron, if these blood moons have happened when Jesus was here, it happened in, I think, 1492, when this, during the Spanish Inquisition, and, and uh, Christopher Columbus discovered America. It happened in 1948 when Israel became a nation. It happened in 1967 during the Great Six Day War. I mean, it didn't happen. All, all, the church had no revelation knowledge regarding these things. But now the church understands about what a blood moon is and what a sun is turned to darkness. And that's what Joel was saying. This is what's going to happen right before the, the coming of the great day of the Lord or the day of the Lord or the coming of the Christ. Now that, this is exactly what they quoted in Acts chapter 2. It is the exact same verses word for word. They're saying, listen, these things are going to happen before the coming of the Lord. So when we see these things happen, when these signs begin to take place, what did Jesus say? He said, you lift up your head because your redemption draw off nigh. So this is a time for us to be getting ready. And that's what we've always said, you need to be ready. So listen what he said. He said, um, Joel 3, 1, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, when he brings them back, listen, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This, this, is, the, this is the coming of the Lord. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. Listen, this
this hat, this was written before it happened. Are you understanding that? Joel is writing, look, the, the prophetic always tells you what's going to happen. He, he proves it in the past, something that happened, tells you something in the present, then tells you something in the future. Joel was writing this before Jesus was born. And Jesus, when he was on this earth, he said his temple won't be destroyed. There won't be one stone left upon another. They thought he was crazy. But exactly what Joel wrote happened. It was destroyed and the Israel people were dispersed all over the world. Could you imagine? what They thought this guy was nuts. Do you think they think we're nuts? They really thought this guy was nuts. You think this was just welcome, welcome? He said, on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. Th this is what happened. This just didn't happen in a week or two. This happened from AD 70 until 1948 when Israel became a nation. Can you wrap your mind around that? that, that I mean, just think how many years before Jesus was on this earth that Joel wrote this saying that this was going to happen, and then it happened, and then they stayed locked in that period from A.D. 70 to 1948. Israel was out of their land. They was dispersed among the nations. This is powerful stuff. They've cast lots for my people, and they have given a boy as payment for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink indeed. What have you to do with me? Joel 3, verse 7. Behold, look, listen to this. Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them. God is going to bring them back into their own homeland. And I will return your retaliation upon your own head. That is why the world's going through some of the things that it's going through. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah. And they shall sell them into the Sabaeans to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let's see. We know some of these scriptures, like one here and one there, they pick out the goodies. You know what I mean? It's like eating in the middle of an Oreo cookie. They just take the center and throw the rest away. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Now listen. Let the nations, in verse 12, let the nations be weakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. This, this is what's going to happen when Jesus returns to this earth. Jesus is going to judge the nations. Can we agree upon that? Then listen to what he says. He says, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down for the wine press is full. The vats are overflowing. Be multitudes, listen to this, multitudes, multitudes in the valley. They're in the valley of decision. Listen, that's where we are today. Multitudes upon multitudes are in the valley of decision. When I think, and he says, for the day of the Lord is near. We need to understand that the day of the Lord is near. This time is short. The things that are happening, I'm telling you, are happening. What you view right here is our parsonage. We've rented out this parsonage to families for 15 years. And then right to the right of the parsonage, you will be able to view our church. But as I said, all these are parts of our ministry. We're a multifaceted ministry, and I really want to share that with you being the senior pastor of Alpha Lions Den Ministry, so you know really what our ministry represents. Don't be lulled to sleep, because the Bible says there'll be those. Jesus said, when I return to the earth, will I even find faith? I mean, where are we at understanding these things? Where are our friends? Where are our family members? And don't think when you tell them they're just going to think, oh, you really know what you're talking about, they're going to accept you. 
No, they're not going to do that. They're going to oppose it. Well, first of all, people hate admitting that they're wrong. That's why God, he exalts the humble. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake. Well, look at this. Go to Revelation 14, 14. Revelation 14, 14. Let's just go back there real quick. Revelation 14, 14. Now look at this. He says this. Go to verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Now we know this, ta this takes place after the mark of the beast. In verse 9 it says, Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, which he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And there spoke of torment of sins forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his image. Okay? Then all of a sudden here he said, then I heard it heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Well, if, if all the church and all the blessed believers in Jesus are taken out of here before any of this stuff happens, and that is the first resurrection, how could there be a resurrection of the dead and the trumpet sound, the last trumpet, sound at the end of the tribulation. The coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord can only be one event. It can't be two different events just because you don't think you're going to su suffer. But then he says this. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Then I looked and behold a white cloud. Now listen to this. And on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown in his hand. And what? A sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him, who sat on the cloud. He said, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the, the vine of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Joel 3, 12. Let the nations be weakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the wine, wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision, the sun and the moon will what? Grow dark. The stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will also rule from Zion. And his voice will, and his voice from Jerusalem, the heavens and the earth will shake. This is exactly what this is describing. Now, Let's go over to, let's go to Zechariah. <coughs> Zechariah. Now listen to this. Zechariah 14. Hey, Wyatt, could you run downstairs and get me a water, please? Since you're the youngest and the fastest man. Oh, Hermie wants to do it? Yeah. All right, Hermie, go on. That's all right, Wyatt. Quick, Hermie, you've got to be quick tonight. Yep. Zechariah 14. 
Zechariah 14. Now listen to this. Remember, I am trying, I am trying to paint you a picture to show you that the day of the Lord is coming and God is revealing things to the church today because it's our obligation to forewarn people. We're the ones to be blowing the trumpet. We're the ones to be sounding the, the, the warnings. Okay? It doesn't say that everybody's going to receive what you say, but we better be telling them something. I mean, the church is just in a state of slumber. The church is in, in, in a state of sleep. That's what's got abortions to 71 million babies, legalized abortions. That's what's got prayer taken out of the school. That's what got the Bible taken out of the school. That's what got marijuana. Man, Herman, you're fast, buddy. Good job. Well, so that's what got the state in, the, in the, the church in the state it's in today. People not wanting to make a decision or to make a stand for truth. You've got to make a stand for truth. Listen, you're never going to make all the people happy all the time anyway. Do you understand when I tell you that I, I ask God why people don't preach the truth and why some churches just refuse to preach the truth? Why don't they make a choice? Why, can, why can't they say who they support or who they don't support? Or why don't they say if they're pro-choice or pro-life or not? Or why, why won't they say, well... You know, they believe in this or they don't believe in that. Because no matter who they pick, they're going to lose 50%. If, if they make a stand for one, they have a chance of losing 50% of the other. And that holds true with everything. That's why they, they avoid the controversial issues. And when I ask God, because I've been praying since I preached that on Sunday, God said that is exactly the state of the church that he spoke about when he said, I would rather you be cold or hot. Because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. It's that lukewarm church. It's that church that's afraid to have any opposition whatsoever. Well, you can't make all the people happy yet, all the time anyway. You might as well make Jesus happy. That's why I told you, the Lord told me, he said, I got an audience of one. He said, you preach to me, you make sure I'm pleased on what you preach, and I'll take care of everything else. He said, every single street corner is your pulpit and the world is your congregation. I mean, think about that. An audience of one. But yet, every single street corner is my pulpit and the whole world is my congregation. That's the way you need to feel. You need to be telling people the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. Now watch this, Zechariah 14, 1. We're still talking about the day of the Lord. Are you with me? Shake your head yes. Behold the day of the Lord. It is coming. We know it's coming. This is the day of Christ. This is when Jesus comes back to the earth. And your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Why would God gather? all the nations of the world to battle against Jerusalem. Because this is going to happen. In order for it to happen, there had to be a Jerusalem. Now, the first time it happened, it wasn't all the nations of the world, because it was just Rome. Rome just came in. They was a one-world leader. They just come in, and they just mowed Jerusalem over. They just overtook the temple. They smashed everything. But here again, just like we read from Joel, they had to be destroyed. They had to be rebuilt. They had to regain their, their um, city again. They had to regain their capital. They had to come back into their homeland. These are, these are miracles that took place. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The, sh the city shall be taken. Listen, the house is rifled. The women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then, then, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. Now, when's God going to do that? It's when he comes back to the earth to set up his kingdom. When is he going to do that? On the Feast of Tabernacles. On the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. It's all going to happen in the same period. It's going to kick it off, and that's how I believe it's going to happen. And 
he's going to fight against the nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. When's that going to take place, my friend? That's when the Lord comes back to the earth. That's on the day of the Lord. That's when the trumpet will sound. Are you with me? Are you seeing it? That's when the trumpet's going to sound. So if the trumpet sounds on the Feast of Trumpets, that's going to be the beginning of everything taking place. You're going to have the Feast of Trumpets, boom, that's going to kick it off. The Day of Atonement's going to be the nations and everybody preparing for the coming of the Lord. And then he's going to be here and he's going to roll and reign. I believe it's all going to happen in a 15-day period. Maybe that's why there's, there's silence in heaven for, what, 30 minutes or something. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faced Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives, listen, shall be split in two from the east to the west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move towards the north, half of it towards the south. Then you shall flee through the mountains and the valleys. Verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. This is what's going to happen when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom on the earth. And in that day it shall be the Lord is one, and his name is one. You know when that's going to happen? It's when Jesus is, comes back to the earth and sets up his kingdom. And the lion's going to lie down with the lamb. There's going to be peace. The king of peace, the king of kings is going to set up his kingdom on this earth. But Pastor Ron, what does this have to do with the feast days? The feast days would all be over there. He says their flesh, in verse 12, their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. This is what I believe the nuclear bomb or, that's going to take place. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them, and everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Um, verse 16. Look at this. Verse 16. No, we're talking about the day of the Lord. We're talking about when God comes back and he sets up his kingdom on this earth. We, everybody should be in agreement with this. If you're pre-mid or post, everybody at least agrees that Jesus is coming back to set up his kingdom on this earth. But I'm going to show you that it has something to do with the feast days. And we're going to wrap the fall feast, the final three feasts, in with Jesus coming and with Jesus setting up his kingdom on this earth to show that it is still important for people who are not Jews clean into the millennium to honor the Feast of Tabernacles. Because some people now just, what they, they don't think it's a big deal. They'd rather worship Santa, Santa Claus. Just think. More people have, think about this. More people have celebrated Santa Claus then they supported Jesus in honoring his birthday when he was born. Think about that. Because they're not the same person, if you don't know. Jesus is not Santa Claus. So if, you, if you're honoring and worshiping that, and, and you're not doing absolutely anything on Tishri 15 when Jesus was really born, you should kind of give that some thought, I think. But let's see what the Bible says here. He said, and it shall come to pass that everyone, does everyone mean everyone? Yes, everyone means everyone. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations. Now listen, my friend, this is all the nations of the earth. He said, and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem they, now it says that God over here, if you remember, that God says that he will bring, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. He's going to bring everybody against Jerusalem at the end. And God is going to intervene, and he is going to come back and save his people once and for all. And he's going to set up his kingdom, and he is going to rule out of Jerusalem. So he said, Everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year. Now listen, what he's saying here is he's painting the picture of all the people who have not worshipped and honored Jesus. He's saying, I'm going to tell you how I want you to honor me. 
I'm going to tell you how I want you to worship me. I'm going to tell you how I want you to remember the things that I did or what I told you to remember while you were on the earth. They shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. Now, how can they worship him? It says, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Zechariah 14, 16. Now listen, this is after everything is over. This is when Jesus comes back the day of the Lord and he sets up his kingdom on this earth. And this is after all the nations are brought against Jerusalem. This is after everything happens and Jesus now sets up his kingdom on this earth. Boom! What do you think Jesus is going to say? Let's celebrate Christmas. I mean, really, that, those are our choices. What are, what are we going to celebrate when Jesus is here? Well, listen, Jesus is here now. The Holy Spirit's here right now. So we should be doing what he wants us to do now, not just in the thousand years when he comes in. He's here physically, and he makes people do it. It's just like when it says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. But the guy said to me, well, no, not every knee is bowed and every tongue is confessed. I said, not yet. But there will come a day, I promise you, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. But listen, then it's too late. It'll be too late. We need to understand what he's talking about here. This is powerful because this is at the end of everything. Look, there's more. He said, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, that's how we're going to go up year to year. That's how we're going to worship the king. How are we going to worship Jesus? By honoring the Feast of Tabernacles. It's important. And listen, it happens in October. And it's the most evil month of the entire year as far as the world goes. All saints' days. They're worshiping dead saints. They're worshiping idols. They're worshiping people. Dead spirits. I mean, ghosts, goblins, witches, warlocks. I mean, and people wonder why their families are under a curse. <laughs> and it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth, I, I, you're still going to have a free choice. I guess you're still going to have a free will. Because it says, and it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come back up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them, there will be no rain. Now listen, we talked earlier about the former rain and the latter rain. I would consider this the latter, latter rain. This is the end of everything. God saying, listen, I ain't going to bring no rain on you. I tell Deborah every time before it's going to rain. Every time I can tell you before it's going to rain. Because when I come to church, I look at the river over there. I look down through Sleepy Hollow. I look at the Loyal Hannah. And every time that thing almost gets dry, I mean, when it almost gets down where I think, hey, Lord, you're going to have to do something. All them fish are going to die. And if it's happening here, it's happening in a lot of other places. And all this thing dries up and all this dies, that dies, everything's going to die. It won't take long if God holds back the rain. You ain't going to have nothing. Nothing. You could go longer without food than you could go longer without water. You'll die first from, from not having water. Water's more important than food. So look, this is provision. Watch this. The Lord of hosts on them, there will be no rain. And if the family of Egypt, which Egypt is a, is a type of the world, you have to know this. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations. Why would God strike entire nations? Listen to me, my friend. When it is all over, why would God strike entire nations? Why would he put a curse? Not just on people. This is when God is on the earth rolling. People don't think he's doing this stuff now. God is in control. <laughs> mm. This is good stuff if you don't know it or not. 
He said, they shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Zechariah 14, 18. God, even in the end, even in the end of the end, he is going to look back and he is going to honor these feasts. What do you think? He's just going to pick one of them. This is one he's giving us an example here, but he's not going to throw all the others out. It's a package deal. And God is getting this word to people who have eyes to see and ears to hear, my friend, because time is short. Just like when the person said to me in the parking lot, he said, well, Pastor Ron, why didn't we know about these blood moons before if they'd been happening for 2,000 years? It wasn't the time. It wasn't the season. The church is learning more now about these feasts and about Jesus' return than they have in the last 2,000 years. So watch. I'm not done yet. He said, verse 19, Zechariah 14, 19. This shall be the punishment of all the world, Egypt, and the punishment of all nations, that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And in that day, this is the day of the Lord, in that day holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on all the bellies of the horses. The pots of the Lord's house shall be like bowls before the altar. And yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord. Listen, folks, this is the clearest picture that I can paint to you about these feasts. They are so important that the Lord likens and he talks about this Feast of Tabernacles that it will be the mandatory feast. I believe they all will be, but he's given you the Feast of Tabernacles as an example. And he's saying all nations will be mandatory to honor these and worship on these and proclaim these during the millennium from the day of the Lord on. That has to show you something. Because people that don't even know this is in their Bible, they think the feasts are all oh, those were just written to the Jews. Well, my friend, if they were just written for the Jews, why when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom, why does he demand that all nations on the earth, the one way that they're going to be able to worship him year after year after year after year is through the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the feast that he likens and he puts, he ties it right together with the day of the Lord. Now, I could go in, and I'm going to get into this Sunday, and I'm going to show you how many times it talks about the day of the Lord. And all these feasts and everything that we're talking about tonight, it's just like pieces of a puzzle. When you look at the day of the Lord, and you look at these feasts, and you look at the Feast of the Trumpets, and you see the layout of how everything happens, it is mind-boggling to see that God has just placed this together through thousands and thousands of years. Way back when Joel said that Israel would be destroyed and Jerusalem would no longer even be in existence. He said that years and years before it ever happened. And for that destruction to happen and then for all them years to go by and God to bring them back as a people and give them their land again. Why do you think these signs are happening? Because God's preparing us for his return. Amen. That's the only reason. Why is the world right now in, a, in the greatest period of decisions? This, is the, this has been the most difficult and different election that has ever taken place. In the history of the world, there's never been anything like this. I know one thing. We've got to be ready. We've got to be telling people. I mean, we have platforms now like we had never had before. And we need to be getting the word out. Let's pray. Father God, once again, in the blessed name of your son, Jesus, we thank you for this word. We thank you for these feasts, Lord God. We thank you for these holy convocations. Lord, you said we were to proclaim them, to preach, teach, and instruct through our lifetime, throughout all eternity. 
And you show us even according to the day of the Lord when you come back to rule and reign on this earth that you will require the nations to worship and honor you through the Feast of Tabernacles. Lord, we thank you for this word this evening, and we ask that you would write it upon our hearts that we would not sin against thee. Lord, let us be a shining light in these last days, these end times. Let us be bold as lions. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you've enjoyed our service. We want to welcome you. You can visit our church at any time. We are located at 716 West 4th Avenue in Derry, Pennsylvania. Our church services are Sunday morning from 9.30 a.m. to about 11.15. We also offer a free lunch after our service. Our Wednesday night services are 6.30 p.m. till 8 p.m. We want to welcome you to be a part of our family. today. But in addition to that, I, I want to tell you, I have a burden for the body of Christ in three areas, spirit, soul, and body. Today, I want to share with you a little bit about the body situation because I know many people who struggle in these very serious areas. One, if you're looking at losing weight, if you have a problem with weight loss, diabetes, or eye issues like macular degeneration or a retinal occlusion where you're going blind or losing your eyesight, I have the answer for you. In addition to that, I have the answer for arthritis. Pain in your neck, lower back, knees, anything with arthritis or inflammation. The answer is Freezor. I'm telling you, I suffered for 16 long years and I tried this product. You need to go to our website. It is Team, T-E-A-M, Freezor, F-R-E-Z-Z-O-R, dot com, forward slash, Pastor Ron. Please go to the website, dial our 800 number. It is 1-888-962-4888. Get your product today. You can buy the Omega-3 and get yourself a shake. I've lost 37 pounds. 37 pounds in seven months. It definitely works. I have the experience and I want the best for you. This product is awesome. Go online, dial the 800 number. God bless you.